I want to greet you all here today. We're delighted to have with us John Brennan. It is my great honor and privilege to welcome and present to you Mr. John Brennan, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. It is uh, great uh, to be here. Um, quite frankly, it's great to be anywhere but Washington these days with what's going on. But it is a special privilege to be here speaking to the World Affairs Council. I've spoken to other World Affairs Councils throughout the United States, and I really um, uh, want to uh, say how much uh, I appreciate your interest in our world affairs at a very challenging time, because uh, there is so much that is going on around the world. Um, but one of the things I want to say before saying some remarks and then opening up to questions is over the course of the last 14 months or so since I've retired, I've had the chance to travel to a number of cities throughout this, this wonderful country. And every time I come to places like Charlotte, and Charlotte where the, the eyes of the nation and the world are going to be riveted tomorrow on the, at the funeral uh, of an icon of the American re religious community, Billy Graham. But other cities as well, it just brings to mind uh, just how special we are as a country, uh, how uh, privileged we are to serve, uh, to be in this country. Uh, and I think we have to keep that in mind when we look at the headlines about all the world's ills and all the challenges. Uh, this is uh, the world's greatest democracy, uh, where our freedoms and liberties every day we're able to take full advantage of. Uh, in fact, there's a book that recently has come out from a Harvard professor, Dr. Steven Pinker, called Enlightenment Now, that talks about how this is the best time uh, to be alive because fewer people uh, die as a result of war and conflict and, and bloodshed and die from medical problems and others that we really are quite privileged to uh, live in 2018 and we are especially privileged to be here in the United States. Uh, now I say that because I want to make sure that it's put into context and also because my wife frequently tells me that whenever I speak to groups I scare and depress people and want to make sure that I don't do that. So I did that in part to make sure that my wife is, uh, you know, I've, I've done the needful there. Uh, also, I should point out that I'm not a Democrat or Republican, although sometimes when I speak out publicly, um, I am roundly criticized and condemned by both the right and the left, depending on what it is that I say. And I think over the course of my 33 years or so in government, uh, there have been an equal number of Republicans and Democrats who called for my resignation or firing at one point or another. So I think I have probably hit it right in terms of down the middle. But as Paul mentioned, I am the son of an immigrant and uh, was always very privileged and, and honored not just for the opportunities I had throughout the course of my government career, but to think that as the son of an immigrant, I was able to ascend to the position of director of, of CIA. And I think it's something that I always uh, will cher cherish. But also, since my father was an immigrant, he immigrated here from Ireland when he was 28 years old, along with my cousin Tom's father. Uh, my father impressed upon myself and my brother and sister just how special it was to be, be born an American citizen and that we should never take for granted those great privileges and benefits we have because we're Americans. He strove for 28 years of his life to come to this country. And so maybe at a very early age, uh, I recognized that I wanted to make sure that I was able to give back to this great country for all the privileges that I've had uh, throughout the course of my life. And I, I have then a special message for all the various students that are here, and I'm so glad that you are here. Um, but what I thought I'd do uh, today is to talk about uh, four phenomena that have uh, focused my attention uh, over the past number of years and are the issues that I tend to talk about now when I go out to universities and talk to groups like yourself. Because I do think we are living in, at a very challenging time, uh, interesting times. That's why I blame a lot of this on Confucius when he overachieved, when he told us, may you live in interesting times. It seems like every day that there is something for us to be you know, concerned about or our attention is uh, focused on. But I'd like to take a step back, and we can talk about North Korea, we can talk about you know, ISIS or Al-Qaeda, whatever. But there are four uh, general trends or, or global trends that I think that all Americans need to be cognizant of and thinking about. The first phenomenon is globalization. Uh, certainly in my relatively short lifetime of 62 years, uh, the world has been transformed by a technolo technologically driven globalization process that has allowed all of us uh, here in the States but also around the world to benefit from the amazing advances in transportation, communication, commerce, trade. We can pick up our phone at any time now and call somebody else uh, on another part of the world. And it's amazing how much that globalization has advanced the human condition in so many ways in so many areas. And we here who have gathered today certainly are some of the prime beneficiaries of that globalization. 
But I think we also have to be very honest that that globalization has had an uneven impact uh, on people, uh, both within countries and between countries. And there are some negative aspects of globalization, particularly for those who feel as though globalization has passed them by or is leaving them behind. Those who, because of the globalized world and because of whether it be automation or outsourcing or other types of things, uh, no longer have the same opportunities that maybe their fathers or grandfathers or grandmothers had in terms of the plants that existed in a lot of the small towns. Uh, they've lost the employment opportunities. Uh, they see that there is growing disparity in terms of income and wealth between those who take full advantage of the opportunities in the globalized world particularly those in the urban centers, those who are more highly educated, those who are more technologically adept than those in the rural areas. And so also a number of people are looking at the migration of people across borders and feel threatened because they believe that their national identity, what it meant to be an American or what it meant to be a Frenchman, is being diluted now because of these foreign influences. And so these are some very real concerns that a number of individuals have, which have given birth to a number of the populist movements that we have seen here in the United States as well as around the globe. Those individuals who believe that they are being left behind and that the government officials and the governments are not paying attention to them and that they are enacting policies that are detrimental to their interests. And therefore, there's been this reaction to this globalized world. But I must tell you that I think it's the inevitable arc of of history, that globalization is going to continue and going to accelerate as we continue to move forward with technology, technologically driven advancements. And so people might be talking about building great walls to prevent that globalization. I think that is foolishness. What we need to do is to try to embrace it, but also make sure that we understand this uneven impact and what we need to do to try to mitigate those downsides. Which brings me to this second phenomenon which is how challenging governance is in the 21st century. And I spent said 33 years in the government, and I must say, over that course of time, I really uh, realized just how frenetic the pace is of government activities, particularly for a country like the United States, that has global responsibilities. Since information moves so quickly, and developments in one part of the world are immediately known in other parts of the world and then have global impact. It can affect markets, it can affect politics, it can affect a wide range of issues. When I joined the agency back in 1980, if there was a coup in Africa, it was probably a CI officer you know, in the African country that would be typing back you know, a, a cable that would then be relayed to Washington that there was a coup taking place. Now, when a coup is taking place, you have the CNN camera crew that is actually following the coup plotters as they go down the streets. So that instantaneous communication and then the perception of what is happening, not just the reality, but the perception of what is happening does have reverberations across the, the globe. And as I look at governments around the world as in individuals who have responsibility for orchestrating the instruments of government, I find that more and more people who ascend to those positions do not have the experience, do not have the expertise, do not have the knowledge necessary in order to carry out those governmental responsibilities in 2018. I have witnessed uh, overseas uh, governments uh, that are inept, incompetent, and corrupt. And getting back to the issue of globalization and all those people who feel that they have been disenfranchised because of the evolution of the world, look then at these individuals who are responsible, at least theoretically or constitutionally, for taking care of their people, and they recognize that these individuals who have these governmental responsibilities are falling far short, which is why they're opting for some of the fringe ideologies to oppose the parties and the officials who are in power. And so I am concerned that as I look out in the 21st century, again with such uh, technologically driven developments around the world, the individuals that do aspire to and then are elected to these positions, they might be elected to them because they have ex experience or uh, notoriety or uh, celebrity in certain areas, but they don't have what it takes to be responsible government officials that are going to try to ensure that their governments and their countries are able to navigate the challenges of the 21st century. I gave a lecture in uh, London last April where I said only half tongue in cheek that maybe we should have some type of eligibility requirement for people who run for office. And I know this is antithetical to our democratic principles that you know, we should be able to elect whoever we want, but whenever I go to a dentist, I expect that dentist to have gone to dental school. 
If I go to a doctor, I want him to have gone to medical school. I expect a judge uh, who presides over a case to have been schooled in the law. But yet we can elect anybody to positions, including of national responsibility, that don't have what I believe are the necessary prerequisites or experiences. So as we go forward in the 21st century, I think that increasing globalization, uh, compounded by the challenges of governance, are leading more and more individuals around the globe to resort to authoritarian measures. Because they can't keep up with the challenges and the requirements, so what do they do? They try to repress and suppress political opposition and any challenges or threats to them. They co-opt their intelligence and security services. They delegitimize the courts. They de delegitimize the media. And they do not allow for the free expression of views. And we see that around the globe, whether it be in places like China or Russia, or in places like Turkey, uh, where President Erdogan is continuing to consolidate power in his hands. And so I was at a conference recently of former senior officials from Europe as well as the United States, and really were a lot of concern about how the growth of the liberal democratic order in the aftermath of World War II as colonial empires collapsed and as sovereign states started to emerge, that growth of democratic liberal democracies has now started to decline. And there are a number of studies that have been done looking out of the past several years how authoritarianism is on the rise in so many countries. So this is something that I think is going to further compound the problems because that suppression and repression of the individual's rights for expression as well as the individual's rights to participate more fully in this globalized economy I think is going to uh, be very, uh, it's going to jeopardize the, uh, the futures of many countries. The third issue uh, which builds upon the, the first two um, is the, the digital domain, that cyber environment. When I joined the agency in 1980, we didn't even have personal computers on our desks. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a digital domain or digital environment. Now, that environment is the venue where most human activity takes place, be it commercial, financial, educational, social, you name it. That's where everything happens, with our ATM cards and our credit cards. Uh, all the things that we do in picking up our iPhones. This is the environment where there is so much opportunity to advance the human condition, but at the same time, it is a venue for troublemakers. And I think, as I was in the government before 9-11 and in the aftermath of 9-11, and thankfully in the aftermath of 9-11, there was an independent commission that was established by Congress that took a very in-depth look at the challenges associated with terrorism and decided to make a number of recommendations and then pass legislation that was going to break down some of those walls that existed between law enforcement and intelligence and really try to protect this country against the recurrence of 9-11 attacks. I think the same thing has to happen in the cyber environment for a variety of reasons. And I don't want to wait for the equivalent of a 9-11 for that to happen so that we take steps after a catastrophic attack. Because there are a lot of adversaries out there not just nation states like the Russias and the Chinas of the world or the North Koreas or Iran's, but also hacktivist groups, individual hackers who have tremendous capability to be able to develop malware and then put it into systems to be able to steal, disable, disrupt, manipulate and exploit that environment. It's a real challenge because the digital domain is one that doesn't respect sovereign borders, nor is it in the physical domain. We all know what the authorities are, responsibilities are, the Charlotte Police Department in the streets to keep you safe. We know what the responsibilities are, the TSA officials at the airports as we go on our planes, Coast Guard, similarly. But what is the role of the government in an environment that is 85% owned and operated by the private sector? How are we going to balance the need for privacy and civil liberties in that environment while at the same time protecting our security and our prosperity? It is a real challenge, and right now I do not believe that there is consensus in the United States about the role of the government, whether it be the FBI, NSA, or CIA. And I'm very concerned about, with all of the advanced technologies that are available to everybody, how the government is going to carry out the rule of law. And I give the example about if a judge on a, in a court here in Charlotte issued a writ to open up a hotel room, or a bank deposit box, or a warehouse, because there is a probable cause to think that there is either information there that's inculpatory or exculpatory of a crime that was committed or that gives insight into plans to carry out an attack against us. The owners of those entities are legally obliged to open up 
those physical environments. But with my iPhone that I can hold warehouses full of data, because of unbreakable encryption, which we all love and want to make sure that we're able to protect our privacy, it can thwart the ability of the legitimate law enforcement and judicial authorities to gain access to information that's going to keep us all safe. And the government's primary responsibility is to protect the well-being and the welfare and the security of its citizens. So these are the things that we have to be thinking about. How is the government in this globalized world with all these increasing challenges of trying to orchestrate the instruments of government while we have this digital environment that is being exploited by so many uh, adversaries? And this is something that I think we have to take seriously. The fourth phenomena, phenomenon is what I call the dance of the superpowers. The United States has been, I think, the world's sole superpower, certainly since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but also has fulfilled the role of leadership of the free world, certainly since World War II, when the United States spearheaded the international effort to reconstruct war-ravaged Europe and Japan with the Marshall Plan in Europe, and making sure that we would then also lead international efforts over the years to address humanitarian disasters, to speak out against human rights abuses and atrocities that take place around the world. And so the United States had this very well-deserved reputation for being at the forefront of what I think all peoples, freedom-loving peoples, want to see, which is the ability for them and their families to be able to live as securely and safely as they can. But now the perception is the United States is receding from those responsibilities. And I must say, in my experience when I was CIA director, a lot of people around the world, as well as in the United States, have a very inflated view about what the United States can do to shape world events. Why aren't we doing this, or why don't we do that? Well, our ability to influence those events is limited, but yet we have greater influence in most instances than any other country in the world. But the perception now, particularly when the signals coming out of Washington are America first, America first, the perception is the United States is now going to use its unrivaled muscularity on the military, economic, and political fronts to be able to strike deals, and almost always then in the bilateral channels, in order to advantage the United States. And so I think a lot of people are scratching their head and saying, well, if the United States is going to do that, it's almost an unfair playing field because the United States has this tremendous, tremendous capability and power. Where is the United States that for many years was trying to make sure that all boats would rise because the United States believed fervently that, in fact, when all those boats rise, it helps the United States national security, but that peace and security and prosperity around the globe is not only in all our interests, but also the right thing to do. And so Russia and China, the other two superpowers right now, that do not have the same breadth of capabilities in the United States, taking full advantage of the perceptions, as well as maybe some of the realities, of the United States stepping away from international agreements, such as the Paris Accord on climate change, such as the signals that are coming out of the Trump White House about the Iranian nuclear deal, that thank goodness we don't have to deal with two nuclear proliferators at this time. Uh, stepping away from that, stepping away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which when I went out to Asia a number of times when I was director, the Asian countries and the counterparts that I interacted with were pleading with the United States to be able to move forward with the TPP as a way to provide a counterweight to what they saw as increasingly dominant Chinese influence in the area. So Xi Jinping, the president of China, who has demonstrated just very recently that he is going to try to further consolidate and uh, elongate his reign by taking away the term limits in China. He has unprecedented power in terms of head of party, head of government, and head of military. And so he's not going to honor the tradition, in fact, of the provision that calls for only a two-term limit. Uh, and Mr. Putin also who consolidates his power. Mr. Putin, I don't think, is as doesn't have the same strategic perspective that Xi Jinping has. I think partly because there's such differences between Russia and China. Russia, which has an economy, basically the equivalent of, of Italy, is a one resource economy. Demographics are against it. It has a drain of, of uh, entrepreneurial and technical talent, uh, an aging population. And so Mr. Putin knows that he needs to, uh, what he's trying to do is reclaim what he believes is Russia's rightful place on the world stage. He needs to do it sooner rather than later. Xi Jinping, on the other hand, maybe because there's a Chinese tradition of a dynastic sort of perspective, has a much more methodical, deliberate, and I think a more calculating and ultimately successful strategy of expanding Chinese influence around the globe with his one belt, one road strategy, not just on the commercial and business and trade side, but also on the security, military, and political side. 
And so when a Xi Jinping, who I you know, equate to a three-dimensional chess player, you know, sits down with counterparts around the world, uh, his depth of expertise, his depth of experience, is really something that he can bring to the fore. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities now that both Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping are pointing to the U.S.'s recent role and recent statements as a way to try to carry favor. They are trying to carry favor with erstwhile partners and allies of the United States, uh, saying that Russia and China are going to be more um, uh, trustworthy uh, partners and allies. So these things are happening uh, at once. These are the tectonic plates of the, of the globe. And so when you look at things that are happening in the Middle East in terms of Syria, Iraq, or Iran, North Korea, or when looking at Al Qaeda or ISIS, these phenomena, which are mutually, in some respects, reinforcing, as we see that ISIS has taken full advantage of the opportunities that exist in the digital domain, much more sophisticated users of that digital environment than Al Qaeda. I think that's partly because there, it was a generational issue that those that gravitated toward ISIS's clarion call really were much more technologically adept than the Al Qaeda members from a, a generation before. And so these things are happening all at the same time, and that's why I think what is going on right now in the United States in Washington, and I was asked previously, what do I think is the number one national security threat to the United States? I really do believe it is the depth of partisan rancor that exists in Washington that has now pervaded the national security environment. Uh, and that partisanship and that animus that exists between the parties in Washington is preventing our government from fulfilling its responsibilities in this globalized, challenging world to address the domestic issues that we need to address, as well as those international issues. And so for my final remarks, I want to direct it to all the students who are here. I was exceptionally privileged for 33 years to serve in one capacity or another in the national security environment. It was something that when I entered it, I didn't know what was going to be ahead of me. I feel exceptionally fortunate to have been a witness to history over a very critical time of this nation's development. And I believe very strongly in the noble professions of intelligence, of law enforcement, and all of those individuals, the women and men, who serve silently, selflessly, and they do it because they want to keep their fellow Americans safe. And it was a great privilege to have been called the director, and now the former director of CIA. So those of you who aspire to national security, please keep your dreams and ambitions alive. And don't pay attention to the words that are coming out of politicians in Washington that denigrate and disparage the great and noble work that they do. Continue to pursue it because this country faces great challenges, even though it's the best time to be alive and it's the best country to be uh, living in. But there are great challenges out there, and we need to have the best of the next generation of young Americans. And so what I've tried to do over the course of my second retirement here is to encourage young Americans to think, how are they going to give back to this great country? Some of you may pursue military careers or law enforcement or intelligence. But even if you're not going to be in the public sector in some way, think about what you need to do to give back to your neighborhoods and your communities. This is a very, very special country. I believe strongly in American exceptionalism. Not because Americans are any better or smarter than anybody else. It's just that this country has had exceptional good fortune through the course of its history. We have a huge country with great natural resources, tremendous arable land, navigable rivers, long coasts, long borders. And I think most of all, we are the melting pot of this world's population. These are things that I think define America and things that we should never forget. And so the, the next generation of Americans, it's going to be up to you to make sure that you do what you can to keep this country strong and safe, particularly since I have three grandchildren and I have a grandchild right now. And so I want to make sure that they're able to live in a country that is safe, uh, safe and secure, even more safe and secure and more prosperous than the one that I grew up in. So thank you very much for your attention. I, again, welcome the opportunity to be here. That was a fascinating discussion, and thank you for taking the complexities of the globe and bringing them down to four trends that we all need to be thinking about. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rena Arline with Bank of America, and I have the privilege of facilitating the question and answer uh, session. So we've got 20 minutes. Um, please keep your questions short and quick. We want to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I'd love to start with the students. And just to, as questions are being teed off, um, what I'd like to ask the director is, can you comment a little bit about the diversity of, your, of the workforce of the CIA. So having grown up in Kenya, I was very much wanting to be a part of the CIA, but I chose banking instead. 
but talk a little bit about, you know, you're talking about globalization. Uh, what are the language skills that are necessary? And um, are you hiring women? What are you seeing from that perspective? Well, I took very seriously my responsibilities as CEO of CIA to make sure that our workforce is as prepared as possible for the future. And I think that there is no organization that can make a better business case for diversity than CIA. CIA is supposed to be this country's eyes and ears uh, around the globe. And in order to do that, we need to be able to speak their languages, be able to understand cultures, be able to have the experiences living there. And so I spearheaded a number of initiatives at the agency to make sure that we're able to welcome individuals of all different backgrounds. And yes, we have some rigid uh, security requirements because we want to make sure that we know who we're going to be entrusting this nation's secrets to. But I think it's critically important for the CIA to really uh, symbolize what it means to be an American. And it means to be as diverse as possible in terms of our world experiences and how we look and, and how we speak. I also uh, felt a, a personal responsibility to make sure that the members of the LGBT community felt welcomed in CIA. For too many years, unfortunately, the LGBT members were um, not treated with the human dignity and respect, as well as equal opportunity, uh, to join the agency as well as to flourish inside it. And so this is something that I think, uh, again, is, the CIA should embody what it means to be an American and be part of the American government. And diversity, I think, is at its core. Thank you. So um, Lauren's got a microphone. So students, questions? Can I see a raise of hands? And please introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm uh, William Harris. I'm a sophomore at Charlotte Country Day School. Uh, and I know you uh, spoke about um, the partisan rancor in our country and how that can negatively impact our national security interests. And so following up on that, I was wondering if you could speak on the uh, recent comments by the director of the NSA, uh, specifically his testimony that uh, President Trump has not ordered him to um, take uh, specific actions to confront Russian cyber attacks on our elections. Uh, and I was specifically wondering um, how greatly this lack of presidential action uh, sort of inhibits our security agencies from being able to proactively uh, sort of counter this threat. Well, I no longer have access to what's going on in the government and in classified environments. Mike Rogers, I have great respect for him. He's a good colleague and friend. And I think both what Mike Rogers, as well as with Christopher Wray, the director of FBI, said about three weeks ago is that they have not been directed by Donald Trump to take additional actions. I am hoping that uh, they and the National Security Council are working as quickly as they can to enhance our defenses as well as to provide options uh, to uh, Donald Trump as well as others about what they should do in the event that we see uh, an increase in what Russia, I think, has been doing for quite some time, which is to try to influence American politics. But this digital environment now just provides uh, such additional opportunities for the Russians and others by setting up these personas and by you know, hacking into servers and then releasing information. So I, I do think it's uh, incumbent upon the President of the United States to make sure that he's able to marshal the capabilities of the U.S. government uh, and do everything possible to mitigate the potential actions of, of our adversaries, whether it be against our electoral systems or whether it be against our financial systems or electric grids or whatever. Uh, Donald Trump and others need to have a better understanding, I think, of some of the complexities of these issues because these are complex issues, just like North Korea, that don't lend themselves to simple solutions. And I was very privileged, and I was talking, Ambassador Irwin, before about I had the great privilege to brief President Clinton uh, and give him the President's Daily Brief every morning. He is somebody who had just had this voracious appetite for information, could process it, and could see correlations, and had this tremendous ability to recall information. Presidents need to you know, roll up their sleeves so they can understand just what you know, are the options so that when policymakers present to the president, you, know, you can do course A, course B, or course C, they need to have familiarity, as much familiarity as possible you know, with it. So on the cyber front right now, with an election coming up, I think, uh, again, it's an obligation of the senior most members of our government to become as familiar as possible with it so they can make the, the best decisions. Do we have any students? Yes, the lady with the jacket. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier that Russia feels as if it has to reclaim some of its former lands to support itself. So with an economy primarily based in Europe and um, like the suppression of voters' rights and just a, a country that really struggles with its geography. If Russia cannot do this, then do you anticipate that they will survive as a country? 
Well, I didn't say I think that Russia believes it needs to reclaim those lands. I think it believes it needs to reclaim its rightful place on the world stage. And it, it, is, it is using a variety of means to do so. In Ukraine, as it went in, and it basically invaded Crimea and annexed Crimea, I don't see Russian tanks uh, moving into the Baltic countries or other countries uh, in the near term. Uh, but what Russia has been particularly adept at doing is influence ev influencing events from inside, using its intelligence security services to support those political parties and politicians who are more likely uh, and are more favorably disposed to support policies that are going to be favorable to Russia. For example, uh, Vladimir Putin's number one objective, I think, over the next year is to get as much relaxation of the international sanctions on Russia that were imposed after the invasion of Ukraine uh, relaxed. And there are a number of political parties and politicians, as well as media outlets in Europe, that basically have become mouthpieces of Russia because of that exploitation. So I think uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, more insidious and in some respects more dangerous in terms of some of the practices and policies that Russian intelligence services pursue. The gentleman with the um, with his hand up right there. Yep. Thank you. Um, we're moving into the next generation of leadership at uh, in Saudi Arabia. Would you comment on uh, your feelings about what what that new generation is going to bring? Right, that's a good question, and I spent about five and a half years of my life uh, over the course of two tours in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you're referring to Prince Mohammed bin Salman, known as MBS, who is now the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who basically is the day-to-day -day decision maker uh, inside of Saudi Arabia. He is the favored and favorite son of King Salman, and he has embarked on a very ambitious program of reform, uh, and also has consolidated power in his hands. And so he has been able to get his father's agreement to summarily dismiss a lot of other members of the royal family from government positions. Uh, so he has consolidated uh, his, his power. And his view is that he cannot wait for uh, the phlegmatic Saudi system to be able to evolve. And therefore, he's taken the bull by the horns. He has violated a lot of royal family protocols by imprisoning uh, some fellow uh, members of the royal family and technocrats. Uh, and he has a very ambitious agenda as far as Saudi Arabia 2030. Uh, he is somebody who is clever and smart, um, but yet, at the same time, I think he has an exaggerated view of his ability to transform Saudi society in a relatively short period of time. He is allowing women to drive starting this June. He's going to be opening up movie theaters. So he has a lot of support within the kingdom for that. But he also was the mastermind behind the Saudi misadventure in Yemen. Um, and the, the, the brutal war that's been going on there that has ravaged that, that country uh, because he had a, an inflated view of what the Saudi military could do. And he also is vehemently anti-Iranian, some would argue anti-Shia. Uh, so I, he is an impressive individual, uh, but like a lot of other authoritarians, uh, he is in a hurry uh, to do things his way. And so he is not trying to promote the growth of democracy in Saudi Arabia. Uh, what he's trying to do is to ensure that he's able to be the decision maker and his father, King Salman, uh, whose you know, health, you know, I think right now is, is stable, but he is waiting to be king and he is, what, 34 years old. So he's looking at the next several decades to be able to impose uh, his will in the kingdom and also in the region as a whole. But I would argue that I don't think the Saudi political scene has, is fully settled yet. Uh, as you can imagine, an individual who has taken the reins so strongly will alienate individuals in the process. And so there are a lot of hard feelings and individuals who feel that they have uh, had their, their pockets uh, um, be subject to his thievery uh, because he did imprison people in a, the Ritz-Carlton, where they stayed up many times in Riyadh and was able to, no pun intended, shake down uh, the members of the royal family for the tune of about $107 billion. Saudi coffers um, have really decreased by about a quarter of a trillion dollars over the last four years. I think there was a high of $750 billion in 2014, and now it's down to a little bit below $500, million, 500 billion because of you know, the lower oil prices, uh, military adventure in Yemen, and other things. So uh, 
Mohammed Salman recognizes that he needs to do things to try to get additional monies to uh, fuel his various initiatives. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I think a lot of the changes in Saudi Arabia are overdue, uh, but uh, he needs to be careful about doing it in a manner that is not going to um, um, stimulate uh, what could be very uh, destabilizing uh, turbulence. So, so I don't make Lauren sprint back and forth. Is there another one on this side, Reggie? Uh, good afternoon. I'm Reggie Pretty. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, comments, and uh, I've, I've made notes of these. Um, and there are a lot of things that are really complex. Just given everything that you've mentioned, the globalization, the governance, the digital domain environment, and the uh, dance of the superpowers, there's a lot of information that's out there. And so one of the things that's come out now has to do with fake news. And you mentioned that I'm going to uh, most likely butcher his name, but the president of China, Xi Jinping. Uh, you mentioned that he was a three-dimensional chess player. So there's a lot of information out there, a lot of smart people, a lot of misdirection, a lot of chess playing. So just curious about your position on the accuracy and the veracity of news. How, how much of that should the public receive and how truthful should that information be? Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's really a tough question, um, and I, I feel for people who may not have had the opportunity that I had to really maybe understand some of these issues and do a lot of study and reading on them, because there's so much contradictory information out there. Uh, and obviously in social media, and particularly the younger generation, a lot of people don't read the old conventional newspapers. They're on their phones and just reading the latest you know, news blurbs that come out. It is really difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff and to discern the truth from the falsehoods. Uh, and I, that's where I think our adversaries take full benefit, advantage of that in terms of propagating and putting into that bloodstream so much disinformation and misinformation as a way, again, to shape views and attitudes, including among voters in the United States, which, uh, again, we, we witnessed in 2016. So um, there are a number of, obviously, very reputable um, uh, news uh, companies. Uh, I am a voracious reader of you know, New York Times, Washington Post. This isn't a plug for them. This is just, you know, I look at Washington Post, New York Times. Uh, the Economist is a great, great uh, magazine that I think tries to have a, a global perspective. Financial Times also. Uh, and a lot of the, the scholarly journals that are, that are out there. But what people can't do is just take the, the last uh, bit that comes out, you know, sort of in the Twitter sphere. And unfortunately, I think there are too many people who take advantage of those, you know, 280 character, you know, blurbs and intentionally and willfully misinform people. And I think it's outrageous when individuals uh, in our government do not epitomize uh, the integrity, the honesty, uh, the values that I have always believed need to be resident, certainly in the Oval Office, but also in government officials. And I think it's sending a very bad signal uh, to particularly the younger generation of Americans that uh, maybe it's okay to uh, you know, shade the truth or engage in these falsehoods, and, and it's not, because it has reverberations. And I am concerned with what is coming out now from Washington is, uh, feeding a lot of the, the fake news that is out there. And not even fake news. I mean, people can just take things that are said verbatim and then push it out, and it has a very harmful, deleterious impact, I think, on U.S. standing around the globe. Let's go to the side. Yes, the student, student right there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Thompson Hoops, and I attend Charlotte Country Day. And I was wondering, you spoke on the consolidation of power among leaders in China and Turkey. Uh, I was wondering, how has the intelligence community viewed these changes, particularly in nations where we've had uh, military or intelligent uh, allies, such as Turkey? Well, the role of the intelligence community is to try to uh, provide the unvarnished, objective, apolitical, nonpartisan truth to policymakers so that they can make the best decisions on behalf of this, this country. And so we will look at and collect information on and then analyze the intelligence that's collected, either through human means or technical means, so that we can explain to the President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Congress, and others what's happening in these various countries. So whether it be in China or Turkey or Saudi Arabia, it is the intelligence community's responsibility to ensure that they have as much perspective as possible 
so that as they plot their next moves, they can anticipate you know, what the impact is going to be, how U.S. interests are threatened, uh, what we can do to be able to advance U.S. interests. Uh, and that's where I think it is so, so important, particularly for the, the heads of the intelligence agencies. You know, Mike Rogers, a tremendous uh, patriot admiral, but the heads of CIA, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, and others really need to be as apolitical, as nonpartisan, as uh, professional and objective as possible. Um, I, was, I was sometimes the skunk of the party when I would go into a policy discussion. And there were a lot of people who were already, you know, had decided for themselves that this was the policy course to go on. And then there would be the intelligence briefing. And then at these National Security Council meetings that Jim Clapper, the former director of national intelligence myself, would be at, we would then bring forth the intelligence. And we would frequently rain on the parade. And it was, you know, not uncomfortable, but we brought a, a reality as well as the analytic and expert perspective to these issues. But I must say, I worked for the six presidents, and every time I would go down to the White House, um, the president of the United States, the ones that I worked for, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, even though they, they challenged the intelligence, they questioned it, but they greatly appreciated and admired the work of those intelligence professionals. And I never felt that I was not welcome. Sometimes my messages were ones that were uh, counter to what I think some of the policy druthers were of individuals, but the role of intelligence was seen as sacrosanct. And I dearly, dearly hope that today, in this administration, that the, not only the intelligence professionals, the rank and file, but those who have the responsibility to speak truth, proverbial truth to power, are fulfilling that obligation and are not going to be cowed or intimidated by individuals who might not like the messages that are coming forward. It is important for every American that those intelligence professionals, those law enforcement professionals do their jobs, irrespective of the, the comments, uh, disparaging or otherwise, that might come at them. So we have time for two more questions. The gentleman all the way in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming to Charlotte. Um, as we all know, the intelligence community that's keeping us safe is not just an American affair, but it's a mosaic of like-minded countries around the world. And in recent months and recent years, a great deal has been written about how some of our allies are underfunding the, their intelligence capabilities and maybe are not contributing as much to the team effort to keep us all safe. What can we do in a constructive fashion as a country to try to encourage more engagement on their behalf and more dedication of resources towards our common goals of a safe world? I think you bring up an excellent point that we, as good as CIA and the rest of the U.S. intelligence community is, we rely so heavily on our allies and partners around the globe. Uh, because we need to have their perspectives, their information. They have unique accesses that we might not have. Uh, and just the way uh, our NATO partners need to increase their support for defense spending and defense capabilities, uh, our partners also need to be able to provide the resources that intelligence services need. So frequently in my travels around the world when I was director of CIA, not only would I meet with my counterparts, but I would frequently meet with the head of state or head of government and the heads of you know, their parliaments or their secretary uh, ministers of foreign affairs to underscore the importance of the work that their intelligence and security services do. That is you know, so, so critically important. But in order to make sure that, that relation, those relationships and that intelligence support stay strong, uh, there also needs to be uh, um, adherence here in this country to the responsibilities that we have to protect their information. And unfortunately, I think over the past year, certainly, there have been instances where, um, you know the old phrase, loose lips sink ships. Well, loose lips can sink partnerships as well. And if information that we obtain from one of our partners, a very sensitive information, then is shared with, for example, just a hypothetical, Russian officials in the Oval Office, <laughs> it will be a strong deterrent to those services that provided that information to us previously to continue to do that. So uh, those, those relationships are critically important, and some of our partners do things that are at great risk to themselves uh, because uh, they want to make sure the United States is able to have the information it needs 
to fulfill, again, what you know, heretofore has been our global role. So we could go on for hours and hours. There's a lady with a blue jacket back there. Hello, my name is Lindsay Golden. I am an intern with the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. As a former intern with the US Department of State, I have a great appreciation for diplomacy and coordination between intelligence agency and diplomats. Considering that President Trump has left many high-level vacancies unfilled at the US Department of State, coupled with decisions to remove the United States from critical international accords like the Paris Agreement and the TPP, it seems more important than ever to place an emphasis on maintaining relationships abroad. What challenges, if any, arise for intelligence agencies when diplomacy has diminished in some nations around the globe? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, uh, Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, uh, is uh, well known for saying, if you're not going to support and fund our diplomats, you need to buy us more bullets. And he wasn't advocating for more bullets, he was advocating for diplomacy. And unfortunately, the Department of State, I think, has been ravaged uh, from a number of fronts. One is that its budget is uh, being reduced by 23%. Uh, a number of individuals within the Department of State, and the US Diplomatic Corps is uh, the absolute best diplomatic corps in the world. And if this country is going to stay strong and safe, we need to have individuals filling those positions that are currently vacant. We need to have the best possible uh, caliber of individuals uh, in the State Depart Department of State. And I have been very disappointed to hear when I've talked to student groups that a number of students have taken themselves out of taking the Foreign Service exam because of what they see as um, a decline in terms of the role and importance of the Department of State. And I've tried to uh, convince them to, to uh, apply because uh, I think this, this chapter that we're in right now of our history uh, which is an, uh, sort of an atypical one, this too shall pass. This is an exceptionally strong country. We are resilient, and I do think that our democratic institutions will prevail. Personally, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. But for those individuals who are looking to serve as a diplomat or as an intelligence officer or as an FBI agent or as a signals intelligence expert, I'm telling them to continue to apply and to get into that pipeline because by the time that you are in the process and in the system and then are going to be hired, hopefully we're going to have the worst of this behind us. But I, I do think that there is uh, going to be you know, a number of challenges uh, in, the, in the near term. And I think that this year, in many respects, is going to be a dispositive year. I have tremendous admiration and respect for Bob Mueller, a very close colleague who I worked with for many years and a close friend, uh, who takes his job very seriously. Uh, he was, he's a registered Republican. He was appointed to head up the FBI by, by George W. Bush. Uh, but he is pursuing his responsibilities in that independent, nonpartisan, apolitical manner. And he will ensure that justice, at least as far as he's able to, to bring it, is going to be served by the investigative work. So I see over the next several months, just the way we've seen over the past two months, that the Department of Justice has brought forward indictments of individuals. And if you notice the Department of Justice indictment two weeks ago on those 13 Russian uh, individuals uh, and the Internet Research Agency in terms of what they did, uh, which was very extensive uh, in terms of what they did uh, to interfere in the election, there was not a single mention of the Russian government or the Russian intelligence services there. So it was very carefully cabined only to deal with foreign citizens of, the, of Russia. It did not address the issue of what the Russian government was doing. And as I mentioned before, the US government has, you know, had indicted a number of officials from the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army. I wouldn't be surprised if you're going to see you know, future indictments of, of Russian officials. And also, uh, people focus on the term collusion, you know, whether it's obstruction of justice or you know, defrauding the government by money laundering. Uh, collusion, you cannot collude with just a foreign citizen. You collude with a foreign government or a foreign intelligence service. So uh, again, I do think that Robert Mueller is gonna continue to pull the various threads and the FBI investigators working for him are among the best. Uh, so 
I, I, and I do believe strongly in this country. I, I would like to be able to end on an optimistic note and to, again, encourage the young students to pursue your dreams, ambitions, and for everybody here to have uh, leave here with optimism that, you know, we're going to get through this. Uh, and it's also going to speak to just how strong our democracy is and how great our country is. Thank you.